California, and she's talking from there. Uh, she's an anthropologist, and who somehow got involved in the, the, the problem of mosquitoes and the release of transgenic mosquitoes and so on. And she's going to give us a view from a, a different side than our modeling. And, uh, this, and this is the, the challenge. So, uh, <coughs> Luisa, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. Boa tarde. Um, good afternoon. I'll, I'll speak in English, but I know you have a multilingual group, so I'm also okay with questions in Spanish or Portuguese. Um, so it's an honor to be present uh, and to present my, some of my work here today. Um, and I would like to thank the organizers for, for the invitation. I'm an assistant professor at the, as um, was mentioned, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Southern California. And um, I did my PhD in this interdisciplinary program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology at MIT in what is called history, in, in the program that's called History, Anthropology, and Science and Technology Studies. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, what this Science and Technology Studies, STS, um, means. So in very simple terms, STS is an interdisciplinary field that examines science and technology in their historical, social, politic, political, economic, and cultural context. So one of the tenets that as a field we argue against is the idea that science and technology is separated from society. Of course, I don't think no one would disagree that scientific and technological development changes society, uh, changes how we relate to one another, and changes what kinds of governance is required, right? The, the very fact that I'm speaking to you from my home in Los Angeles is a simple proof of the power of techno science to change the world. However, um, S, what SCS scholars show that this flow, this imagined flow, is not only happening in one direction. There isn't, so the, the graph I'm showing, what we argue is that it's not true. There's no such a thing as scientists in their lab, neutral, apolitical, beyond culture, who develop something and then that gets disseminated to society and that only then it acquires social, cultural, and political meaning. Our argument as STS scholars is that science and technology do shape society, but that society also shapes science and technology. In fact, you can't even separate these two spheres. They're co-produced. Society, its values, its meanings, its politics is very much part and parcel of science and technology. And it's perhaps easy to grasp this when we consider what kind of research is funded and which ones are not, what kinds of questions are asked, which ones are not, what solutions are proposed and which ones are not even considered, who produces these techno-scientific innovations, how they do it, when and where they do it, and even how these are described by the scientists themselves. So in my presentation today, I'll prompt us to reflect on this very co-production of science, uh, technology, and society. So this is my STS side. As an anthropologist, I try to examine this co-production mainly through ethnographic research. In this case, Participant observation is one of the most important uh, methods of, of data collection based on what is called deep hanging out, um, which allows the anthropologist to immerse herself in a cultural group or social experience, scientists and, and science production being uh, one example of that. So to start my uh, presentation, I'll take you to a moment uh, during my field work. Um, it was a hot morning in Juazeiro in Bahia, northeast of Brazil. When I arrived at the biofactory, I found workers and scientists celebrating. Once they saw me, they called, Luisa, come and see how wonderful the posturas, the lanes, were. I noticed that the 10 to by 30 centimeters paper strips had much darker stains than others I had seen before. These stains contained hundreds, even thousands of eggs from Aedes aegypti mosquitoes. I asked if they knew why the females had laid more eggs. They explained that another container with water and an extra paper strip had been added inside the cages. One of the scientists, Jacquelini, commented, 
Maybe they were too stressed with not enough space before. It's great that they have laid so many more eggs. We really need to increase production. The idea of producing mosquitoes, I did the jib tie, no less, might seem strange at first. As I'm sure most of you probably know, um, this mosquito species is the vector of pathogenic viruses that can cause diseases, such as dengue, chikungunya, zika, and yellow fever. This strangeness was exactly what learned me, uh, what had learned me to Juazeiro, to this biofactory that was mass producing a version of Aedes aegypti, genetically modified to carry a transgene that could prevent the mosquito the, the mosquito offspring from reaching adulthood. Um, these modified insects were to be released in the hopes that they would mate with the wild Aedes aegypti, leading to the death, death of their heterozygote progeny, uh, of the death, heterozygote progeny of such couplings. The goal was to reduce the overall Aedes aegypti population, lessening the transmission of mosquito-borne diseases. So from April to May 2013, um, I conducted field work in Juazeiro with scientists and workers producing this transgenic organism, exploring the apparently paradoxical situation of deploying mosquitoes as a strategy to tackle mosquito-borne diseases. And um, if anyone is interested later, uh, I can talk more about the, this genetic modification and how it works. Um, but I also know you have other lecturers with, who are ecologists and biologists, and I'm sure they will discuss the science itself more in depth. Um, but just to clarify, here I'll be talking about the version of modified mosquitoes that were being released in 2013 when I did field work. And since then, other types of transgenic mosquitoes have, have been developed and, and released. Um, so today, I'll present uh, on my findings based on my ethnographic research, which have also been published in this article entitled Becoming Without, Making Transgenic Mosquitoes and Disease Control in Brazil. So here I report on how my scientist interlocutors work to make the Aedes aegypti embody a solution to the very problem these insects constituted. They hope to turn mosquitoes framed as enemies of humans into an odd kind of ally agents that could have done their own kind. In doing so, and I'll, if these are the things I'll focus on my presentation today, my ethnographic research also allowed me to review aspects related to regionalism, class, and gender of these, uh, within these uh, releases of mosquito, transgenic mosquitoes. You might be surprised, but I'm not the first anthropologist or STS scholar to study mosquitoes, not even the first one to study modified mosquitoes. What these other scholars have highlighted um, is how these strategies transform multi-species relations, turning the mosquito into a, what could be called like a fine public health tool or an auxiliary instrument in attempts to control diseases. The company promoting this strain of transgenic mosquitoes has trademarked uh, the names friendly mosquito in English and Aedes do bem, so the, the good Aedes in Portuguese using these terms in their publicity campaigns, which seems a clear declaration that for the project to work, public perceptions of mosquitoes must change. My argument, however, is different. Implementing this genetic strategy entails more than just turning a loaded organism into something, in some sort of friendly mosquito. If the Aedes aegypti did not transmit diseases, or did not exist in the area, there would be no reason to release its transgenic counterpart. So to put it differently, the mosquito can only exist as an ally or a friend, only to the extent that it also exists simultaneously as an enemy. So what follows in this presentation, I'll offer ethnographic descriptions of rearing practices inside the biofactory and of public engagement activities examining the more than human politics of um, transgenic mosquitoes. And more than human is how anthropologists and SDS scholars grew the kind of concept that they, we use to discuss that the politics that go beyond just the human. Um, this genetic modification was done on the grounds that since this species can transmit pathogens, 
its absence will be beneficial to human health. So when transgenic mosquitoes are deployed, their own reproduction is transformed into labor of, for killing. Mosquito breeding and mating are operationalized as insecticides, turned into a sort of deadly reproductive labor. Therefore, in the case of the genetic strategy, value is generated to the experience of not being bitten by the transgenic males, as well as the embodied promise that these insects would reduce the population size of their biting species. It was this non-encounter, this absence, a future severing of human-mosquito relations that motivated the rearing and release of these value-added insects. And in the ad article version, um, I have a more theoretical discussion about this concept of non-encounter, um, but I'll skip that because I think uh, I I'm happy to talk about it during the Q&A, but I'll, I'll, I'll keep the, the anthro theory and SDS theory a little bit um, in the sidelines. So as a result, to implement this genetic strategy, pro uh, proponents of this technology had to re-engineer not only the mosquito body, but also three different aspects of the human mosquito encounter. So first, they had to transform insect that was long seen as an enemy into an ally. Second, they needed to make rather than kill mosquitoes. And third, they had to re-envision human mosquito encounters as the ones in which mosquitoes, especially the released ones, do not bite humans. As they try to make sense of and explain these radically novel terms of human-mosquito relations, proponents of these genetically modified organisms, nonetheless, often made use of older versions of animality. They deploy antiquated sociobiological ideas about males as he heroic and horny and females as villainous and picky. Apparently, novel mosquito-human socialities were quickly narrated in ways that align with all too hegemonic gendered human sociality. So these three different aspects is how I'll organize my talk today. So I'll talk a little bit about um, the enemy when death has wings, the work of reproduction, bites, blood, saliva, and sweat, and in the end, um, I'll provide some very brief final considerations and just say a couple of things about my current research project. So as an anthropologist, I'll take you again to my field site. At the end of a day at field work in Juazeiro, a city in the northeast of uh, Brazil, I sat in bed trying to uh, write up my notes for the day. As ethnographers, we produce ethnographic diaries, we, which report on our interactions in the field. But writing my ethnographic diary was uh, in doing that in my small room with a noisy fan to, uh, that did not alleviate the suffocating heat was challenging. So I moved to the porch to breathe in some fresh air. Not long after I sat down, an itch on my left arm prompted a quick swat from my right hand. I turned my hand over to see a dead mosquito with blood smeared on my skin. As I inspected the dead mosquito that afternoon, my trained eye recognized its black and white stripe as a telltale signature of the Aedes aegypti. Female mosquitoes need blood to mature their eggs. An Aedes aegypti that bites someone with dengue um, can become infected with the virus and later, as it bites another person, the mosquito's infected saliva enters the human body. So it's in the second act of biting that mosquitoes transmit uh, viruses that can cause diseases. That day on the porch, as I stared at the mosquito and at blood on the palm of my hand, my fear of contracting dengue um, became a visceral reminder of what's behind the sometimes abstract numbers showing the increase and spread of cases. The city Juazeiro was having a dengue outbreak and the bite, that fleeting encounter, could have infected me with the virus. Historians of health and science have shown that once the scientific community agreed that the Aedes aegypti bites could transmit yellow fever, the insect became the target of strategies to control diseases. For the philosopher of science, François de la Porte, the notion of disease vectors redefined the alliance among living things. 
Or as George Cangrian put it in the foreword to, to De La Porte's book, the elucidation of yellow fever's mode of transmission altered the figure of death, making possible a rhetoric that claimed that death has wings. Mosquitoes became not only ecologically, but ontologically defined as vectors, as enemies. I won't go in detail about the history of mosquito control in Brazil, um, which I actually have written with, uh, together with um, historian Gabriel Lopez. But what is important to highlight is that Brazil has a long history of attempting to eliminate, to eradicate the Aedes aegypti. And while these transgenic mosquitoes are often presented in popular and scientific media as a new ethical framework for species eradication, this technology can alternatively be understood as a new phase in a continuous effort to not encounter with these insects. So anthropologists of health and science and Kelly and Javier Lezan have described this historical effort as insecticidal utopianism, an eagerness for the non-existence of certain insects, or at least their distance from humans. Humans have long striven to reinforce a distance between themselves and mosquitoes with eradication sought by scientists and policymakers as something not only feasible, but also desirable. If there's a continuity in the human effort to not encounter these insects, considered to be in the potentially dangerous somatic proximity, what is new is the use of mosquitoes themselves in these endeavors. This transformation from an organism that carries a problem, a pathogen, to one that carries the solution, its own uh, self-species, its own species self-annihilation, turns mosquitoes into something valuable. Yet the mosquito as an ally in the quest for healthier humans can only exist to the extent that the mosquito as an enemy is still looming threatening in the background. It is through this paradoxical mosquito-human interaction that the, the strategy can generate this value. To make mosquitoes value here can be understood not only through the money saved from health and death costs, but also through the money um, to mosquitoes as a commodity. The transgenic Aedes aegypti examined here contain this genetic construct developed and patented by Oxitec, a spin-off company uh, of Oxford University in the United Kingdom. In 2013, Oxitec was trying to assure that the mosquito technology would be considered an effective tool to address diseases. Some scientists, especially those working at Oxitec, claim that after a prolonged period of releases, the Aedes aegypti population can be suppressed to a point that results mosquito, um, that results um, in the mosquito local elimination. So a rehash of the, the century old desire to annihilate the species. However, most entomologists I have talked to assert that even if the population size is reduced, local elimination of the species through this genetic strategy is infeasible. Thus, with this genetic strain, eradication was not truly the goal. In fact, the strategy entails the ongoing continuous release of this transgenic organism. If releases are discontinued, the mosquito population tends to return to its original numbers or might even increase. Indeed, um, results published after my fieldwork show that there was a suppression of the Aedes aegypti population during sustained releases. But once they stopped, there was a gradual recovery to pre-release numbers, bringing no lasting, uh, long lasting benefit to residents of the areas where experiments were conducted. The need for constant releases creates a business model in which to prevent future Aedes aegypti generations, there must be a continuous production and release of transgenic mosquitoes. In other words, Oxitec hoped that what was considered a past would be embraced as a product. This is yet another example of what several STS uh, anthropologists and STS scholars have analyzed as life itself being remade through biotechnology with the generative capacity of living beings and living materials uh, being remade, uh, uh, transformed into commodities circulating across different spheres to produce capital. However, during my fieldwork, 
I could not investigate the promissory process of commodification or capital accumulation in the mosquitoes, since at the time, the mosquitoes was not yet a commodity. It had been approved in Brazil only as part of a research experiment in a collaboration between Sao Paulo University, USP, and Moscameji, a not-for-profit social organization where the biofactory was located. And here, let's talk a little bit about the matters of regionalism, of regional uh, politics in the release of these transgenic mosquitoes. Although these releases were being conducted in the northeast of the country, all staff scientists working on them, as well as the biofactories director at the time, were from Brazil's southeast. As someone who is also from the southeast and from Minas Gerais, I was quickly categorized by the biofactory workers, all of whom were locals, uh, as yet another sulista, as they called, who was there temporarily to gather knowledge about the releases. Even though the biofactory had initially been established in 2005 to control pests and contribute to regional agricultural development, and even though the researchers, all of them white, most of them from Sao Paulo, were convinced they could improve the national policy for mosquito-borne diseases and promote national scientific development, the workers were aware of the politics of conducting experiments in the Northeast, the Northeast Sertão, the semi-arid hinterlands, a historically marginalized part of the country. The anthropologist of science and health, Rosana Castro, has described how Brazil's social and racial, and, and in my case, also regional, inequalities are reframed by scientists as conditions that enable and propel scientific research in the country, what Castro defines as opportune precariousness. Thus, the workers' jokes and remarks about the Sulistas could be understood as social commentaries on the regional geopolitics at play in these experimental releases. Medical anthropologist Joanna Crane has described similar circumstances in collaborations between Uganda and US-based universities, where the poverty and inequality that institutions in the United States or in Europe are aspiring to remedy is also what makes their, health, their global health programs both possible and popular. Crane defined these as valuable inequalities. In the, okay, I'm just seeing a chat. I, Oh, okay. I won't. I won't look at chat. So if anyone has to say something, I'll, I'll um, please like just tell me. Um, in the Brazilian case, then they would be national valuable inequalities. Um, after all, within Brazil, our global north is the south, right? The regional geopolitics in Brazil are inverted. During my field work, mosquitoes were released in a few neighborhoods in the outskirts of Juazeiro. The preparations were underway for a large-scale citywide project in Jacobina, also located in the state of Bahia. Here, a crucial aspect was producing these insects at the numbers needed for these extensive releases. So in this next session, I describe how these transgenic mosquitoes needed to be reared as care-demanding organisms, as well as tenderized productions of large-scale uh, manufacturing. During my field work, scientists and workers in the biofactory were seeking ways to allow them to cater to the mosquitoes' needs while simultaneously improving the efficiency needed for mass production. Remember, they have to, the production needs to be constant, right? Otherwise, the mosquito will um, grow again. And control over the insect's capacity for biological reproduction was vital for the feasibility and continuity of the project the production of transgenic mosquitoes, as my initial vignette uh, on the number of eggs shows. Since the project aimed at releasing only non-binding transgenic males, sex separation of mosquitoes, described as sexaging or sexing, was arguably the most labor-intensive task of production. Um, and I can, I'm happy to show, talk later about more about this process. These to be released males were called mosquitoes de supressão, suppression mosquitoes, because of their assigned role to reduce Aedes aegypti population. Only males were released, but females were still needed in the biofactory um, to maintain 
the continuous production of the mosquitoes de supressão. Those who stayed, those that stayed inside the biofactory were the mosquitoes de colonia, colony mosquitoes, continuing the lineage in a collection of cages, each containing around 1,500 females and 500 males. There was thus a focus on the production of male and the reproduction capacity of females. The rearing of mosquitoes in the biofactory becomes an almost character insect version of what feminist scholars have long been pointing out as the perception of women merely as means of reproduction. So let's now unpack some of the more than human gendered politics of these transgenic mosquitoes. And here I'll try to make this more interactive. Uh, I know it's the end of the day for you there, um, so maybe it will be a little bit more lively. Um, so I'll ask you to start analyzing some of the quotes that I'll share. So the first one, we release these mosquitoes and they do all the work for us. This technology works so well because the best thing mashes males can do is to find females. All mashes think about is sex, one of the scientists jokingly noted. Someone that wants to say what they, how they would analyze this, this quote. Any, any comments? I'm hearing, but not very, uh, not loud enough. Oh. It's coming. Yeah, thank you. Oh, hello. Well, um, <laughs> I, I really believe that if you release a just male, you, you can control the population of mosquitoes because they cannot reproduce because they had again the, the, the gene, which is killer gene, right? That I right. understand. So, so by great, yeah. So, oh, go ahead. But I don't understand how do you how do you measure the distance between the human and mosquitoes? And I will say that I don't I don't understand how this technique is sustainable in time. Is to say uh, you all always have to release continuously you have to release mosquitoes and it cannot be sustainable and maybe can also transmit the, the genes to the other generations. So I don't understand very well how, how, how it is. Great, so it's not, like this version is not sustainable. Um, that's what I said, it's like a business model um, to continue, like you have to continuously produce the technology. Um, and it's true, so it, they, they have a reason to release only males because males don't bite uh, and males could mate with the wild females. Um, but I was asking like in this quote, what are some of like, if you heard this quote, what would you understand that the scientist was saying? So, sorry, I don't understand. If you, if you heard this quote from a scientist saying, macho só pensa em fêmea, macho só pensa em sexo, um, what were, some of the things, right? Like all mashes think about is sex. What were some of the things you would, uh, how would you interpret this, this part of the quote? Not like, not the technology itself. I know you're, most of you are not coming from anthropologists. So it's like an exercise to be an anthropologist and analyze the, the, the language of scientists more than the technology itself. I don't have a clear idea how to interpret that sentence. Okay. The, no, good. Okay. Anyone I, else? I think has it's a, a bad way to send a message. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay. So I'll, I'll stick with that bad way to send a message, which I, again, uh, as an no, anthropologist, I'm not. I, yes. With a yes. sentence like that, I would say no comment. <laughs> <laughs> Great. But uh, I would think that the researcher has some kind of gender bias. Laisa from the chat um, responded. Yes, so um, 
During field work, I heard many variations of jokes about horny mashes that driven by the insatiable and unending desire for sex won over picky females. That's how they would call it as well, right? That females are picky. The per person telling uh, the joke uh, that was almost always a man would usually not specify that the joke was about mosquitoes, right? When you say all mashes uh, think about is sex, you're not saying, they would not say all male mosquitoes are think about is sex. They often, with the joke was, the, the reason, like it was a joke because they were saying mashes, right? They were um, making it much more, more than about just about mosquitoes. The person telling the joke, almost always a man, would usually not specify that the joke was about mosquitoes. Therefore, implying that these remarks refer to not just to insects, but also to more than insect gender sexuality. So, right? So to insects and humans alike. The supposedly natural instinct of males to hunt down females was then mobilized to explain the approach's efficacy and naturalness. And also as for the next part, we can think about this. Um, we release these mosquitoes and they do all the work for us. Keep keep a pen there, keep it, keep it in your memory because we're, go we're gonna go back to it uh, later. So although um, scientists framed the project as mosquitoes doing the world work, rearing transgenic mosquitoes required a lot of human labor, which was often, uh, which often caused some resentment from workers. So here, let's talk about another aspect, uh, the class dynamics within these projects. In one of my first days visiting the biofactory, I joined Francisca and Jonathan, two workers there, in preparing the food for transgenic larvae. To maintain standardized production, the genetically engineered mosquitoes were given the same fish food that was used in the English laboratory uh, which, in which they were developed, right, in Oxford. But in Brazil, this fish food became a super expensive imported brand. Moreover, the fish food needed to be grounded twice and later sifted to turn into a very fine powder, which was incredibly messy and very, very labor intensive. Um, but these steps ensure that there were no clumps, so it could be precisely measured and more easily dissolved in the water. While they went through this arduous and messy process, Jonathan remarked, all this imported food and we need to go through all this effort to feed them. After a short reflective pause, he said, shaking his head, these mosquitoes have a better life than I have. Okay, so let's try again. What, how would you interpret it, uh, this, this sentence or this quote? What were some, some things that come to your mind? Comparing like a worker's life from a, with a mosquito life. Hello, can, can, can you hear me? Comparing, so this quote with between um, the workers comparing his own life with the mosquito life. What are some of the okay, uh, analysis you can make of this? Yeah. Again, I know this is not unusual exercise for, for most of you, but. Um, okay, hi, C can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay, um, well, first of all, this, these mosquitoes have a better life than I have. Sounds like, first we're like anthropomorph, anthropomorphizing. That, that's how one, one says, says it? Yes. Uh, the mosquitoes, uh, first of all. It is like the, the previous quote where we, uh, they said uh, machos think only, only think about sex. It, uh, and, you know, like it was the, 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 the other tone was that it, it kind of sounded like we were talking about humans. And I, I get kind of the same feeling here that uh, mosquitoes have a better life than I have. Is the, uh, we are giving like human characteristics to mosquitoes? Something along. That's great. Okay. okay. Yes. So, so they're thinking well, mosquito life and human life in the same terms. That's great. Anthropomorphizing. Uh, and why are they doing that? What kind of? What kind of? Uh, if 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 a worker told you this, what what do you think they meant? Like beyond just their words. What kind of comparison are they hoping to do? Do you think they see their, their work as valued? 
within the biofactory. Oh, um, well, I, if they have to work for the mosquitoes, then I, 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 I can't imagine that they will feel that, that good about it. It is like we usually view mosquitoes as well, insects, and they are working for the mosquitoes, so I, do, I am not, I'm not sure if they are very happy about that the mosquitoes have a better life than they have. Great to <laughs> Okay, great. Any other comments? But those are great. Okay. So, um, wait, sorry. There's one more. Um, oh, there's another one? Great. It seems to me that the humans are like serving them. They're like their servants, so to say. Exactly. But not all humans, right? Yeah, there is these work, the category. They have to feed them. Not the exactly. Animals. So that's a exactly the point, right? So there's some worker, some humans, the workers, like the, there's a kind of inversion of how we think about species hierarchies, right? Which mosquitoes are seen as more valuable than the workers themselves. Uh, even though these mosquitoes are to be killed uh, in the end, like right, their 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 whole existence is so that their species are reduced. We still see this kind of species hierarchy being shifted in a in a very strange way. Who who gets to be considered valuable and who doesn't? Um, so the the workers, as what the first comment mentioned, that workers, um, such comments and jokes about the good life and the high maintenance. Uh, they often would say, like, oh, mosquitoes, they, they're just so needy and <laughs> they're very high maintenance. Um, these comments were very common within the biofactory, where uh, many of the workers came from a low-income background. The workers would often call attention to the apparent contradiction of spending so much time, energy, and money producing an organism and caring for an organism that is often an unwanted guest in our houses and bodies. And another point that I want to highlight is perhaps the remarks about these mosquitoes be made to be at the same time commodity and labor, or also a social critique of how more value seems to be given to the labor of mosquitoes than to the human labor needed to implement the strategy, right? Remember um, this other quote, And they do all the work for us, right? So um, the the work of this strategy was putting being put in the in the mosquitoes and not on the underpaid workers in the biofactory. Can you hear me? Because I I just noticed the my neighbor is cutting grass, but let me know if it gets too noisy. Um, yes, we can read. You can listen. Perfect. Perfect. These instances also highlight the paradoxical situation in which situations that outside are fiercely avoided, right? We don't want Aedes aegypti to lay eggs, we don't want them to develop to adulthood, and we do not want them to mate, could only happen at the biofactory because of labor-intensive efforts and expensive infrastructure. The viability of this strategy, however, depended not only on the capacity to manufacture mosquitoes, but also on the local human population perceived, perceiving release mosquitoes as severing the human mosquito relation. To convince them, proponents presented the transgenic male as a non-biting organism. In the next section, which is like the final research one, um, I described the different ways in which the scientists attempted to redefine the mosquito-human encounter of biting being bitten. This is a photo of the, of the biofactory. Um, Aedes aegypti, as I'm sure most of you know, is highly urban uh, and anthropophilic, right? So it prefers biting humans. So it has a, a long history of living with and alongside humans. Female bite, females bite because blood is a requirement to enable the mosquito reproduction. But humans do not usually want the bite, do not want the insect proboscis piercing their skin, and do not want mosquito saliva, which might contain pathogens. So in this multi-species uh, interaction, the exchange of fluids means the survival of some beings, mosquitoes, but a potential threat to others, humans. The bite then is a haptic reminder of how the production of diseases is always relational in our porous and permeable bodies. In spite of this preference for human blood, during my time at visiting the biofactory, I learned that enough human blood could not be acquired to meet the demands of a large-scale mosquito production. So goat, um, 
goat blood from a local um, slaughterhouse was used. And I should add that goat meat is very typical of the region. Um, and a worker once remarked that the mosquitoes were uh, tasting the, the local cuisine. To feed mosquitoes, um, a worker would take a metal plate, wrap it with plastic foil, and inject the goat blood in between the metal plate and the plastic foil. To attend to Aedes aegypti's preference for humans, however, before injecting blood, the blood, some workers would also take this, the plastic, this plastic here, you can see, um, and then rub it in the in their kind of neck and face to get some of their sweat smell, and only then wrap the wrap it around the metal plate. Additionally, a heat bag was placed on top of the blood and uh, metal. The temperature and human smell were, the hope was, would incite more mosquitoes to bite, and as a result, more eggs would be laid. These practices attempted to create the first redefinition of the biting being bitten uh, encounter by pneumatically transforming blood of goat, an animal which is food for humans, into a form of humans as food, the transgenic Aedes aegypti could defend and therefore reproduce without having them pierce their proboscis into human skin. However, the paramount human mosquito encounter that had to be re-envisioned was the one outside the biofactory. Um, as part of the group's public engagement effort, I travel over the course of a weekend uh, to Jacobina with a worker and a staff scientist to organize an event before releases in the city. We set up a small tent in the main shopping street and we brought a box of fine mesh net picked with swarming transgenic mosquitoes to showcase. While we prepare for the day's activities, the scientist Pedro confirmed that there were uh, only males in the box, putting his own hand inside and making sure none of the mosquitoes would bite him. He knew that errors can happen in sex separation based on pupil size and that one single biting mosquito would be enough to alarm those around it, failed the expected goal of acquiring public support. Throughout the day, passersby were invited to put their hands inside the box and confirm that they would not be bitten. To have the hands surrounded uh, by swarming Aedes aegypti was to have proximity without being bit, uh, to have proximity without the bite. To put the hand inside a box teeming with mosquitoes became an evidentiary practice, a somatic test to establish a new kind of human mosquito relation. This, choreograph this choreographed encounter, these non-bites of transgenic males, proponents hoped, should represent a performative experiential promise of a non-encounter, thus yielding the, the non-encounter value of these genetically modified organisms. That day in Jacobina, as we stood underneath the tent, one person passing by pointed to the box swarming uh, mosquitoes and asked, are these the mosquito da dengue, the uh, dengue mosquitoes? The person looked at me for a reply, but I personally <laughs> do not know, I didn't know how to respond. The sameness or not of these transgenic mosquitoes, are transgenic mosquitoes the same as non-transgenic, um, is, and was and still is one of the questions that in, intrigues me and drives my research. But Pedro, the scientist, quickly came toward us and answered, no, 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 this is a transgenic mosquito. The person skeptically stared at the box. So the scientist started to describe how the transgenic mosquito strategy worked, how the group releasing had been dealing with this strain for a long time, and how the experiments in Juazeiro and other parts of the world had been done. Then he added, we are only releasing males. They are the heroes that arrive to fight dengue. It's only the females that bites for blood. It is she who is the villain of in this story. So again, to make it a little bit more interactive, I'm gonna show a video of a, like an um, early promotional video from Oxitec. And again, try to think, try to think as an anthropologist, what are some of the things you notice um, about the video? How are the mosquitoes? They're anthropomorphized, right? They're mosquitoes that are going to be as if humans, how each of the two mosquitoes are being portrayed. And I'll, um, I'll go a little bit.
So the video is like, it's a, a mixture between Portuguese. I hope everyone can understand some, but then the, some of it is in English with Portuguese subtitles. But even if you don't understand Portuguese, you should be able to like grasp by the, by other, other might even be interesting because you can grasp other things. We cannot listen the video. A gente não está escutando o vídeo. Do you not hear? No. Did someone say something? No. No, we cannot listen it. Just uh, no. Mm. Do you think if I send a, a link, you could show? Do you think that works? And then if I can do that. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, uh, I can. I think that in Zoom there is an option that says like share audio. Uh, okay. So maybe if you click that. Uh, next to mute. Oops. Yeah, there is mute, oh. there is an, an, an up arrow next mm -hmm. to mute. There you can, you can uh, Like share audio, audio settings? Probably, right? Maybe. But there is an option to, 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 to share audio, uh, the computer audio. I like speaker. Switch to phone audio, leave, com leave computer audio. Do you think it's that? No. Uh, I'm sorry, I should have tested that before. If if we can also if it's also I don't know. A gente vai chamar o, o rapaz aqui que está ajudando com a parte Beleza. técnica, Luísa. Quanto isso eu vou procurando aqui? Speaker. Yes. Tem um vídeo no computador dela e ela quer que a gente escute, mas a gente não está escutando. É, Luísa, eu algum... Você precisa. Ah, ok. Quer que eu coloque aqui? Não, o que for mais fácil. Não, porque você pode compartilhar o áudio do teu computador também. Como que eu faço isso? Eu, eu, eu você coloquei preci... a peixe Você precisa estar com a tela mundo. compartilhada primeiro. Ok. Okay. Aí você vai ter um menu com muitas opções e três pontinhos. Clica no três pontinhos. No ali três em cima pontinhos, ali. Aqui, more. Uh -huh. aqui vi. Aí vai é... ter alguma coisa como share áudio. Oh, share computer style. Isso. Vamos ver agora. Acho que agora deve ter dado. Dengue fever is a flu-like. Estão escutando ou não? Deu certo. Obrigada. É um mosquito Aedes aegypti. Falamos com um macho e uma fêmea. Aedes, Egipta. Obrigado por se deixarem filmar. Not at all, darling. Come a little closer. I won't bite. <risos> então, essa é a sua casa? Yes, isn't it perfect, darling? I just moved from the plant pot in the hallway to be closer to my delicious family. <risos> Of course, Aid here doesn't partake. He's a veggie. Honestly, call yourself a mosquito. Well, um... Hades just follows me around. 
It's the only thing he's good at. Já ouviram falar da dengue? Darling, I feed, I mate, I lay eggs. I'll bite you whether you're sick or not. If that means I pass your horrid little disease on to the next person, it's not my problem. Você entende que é por isso que os humanos borrifam substâncias químicas, por sua causa. Darling, I know. It's all about me. <laughs> Oh, you explain, Aid. I can't be bothered. Um, well, humans have been using fogs to try and kill us for 50 years, and it does kill other insects. But we're getting used to it now. Besides, humans don't like fogging their own homes, so we're safe in here. E o método da Oxitec? What's that? Another useless attempt to get rid of us? Just because I'm mindful of time, we can... Um... Stop here. They explain the technology and uh, you can see the video later if you want. But what were some of the things you noticed from the video? How are the mosquitoes portrayed? Any anything that called your attention? The same type of message that you comment before about sexism and the the female to be the bad one, stuff like that. Exactly, right? The voice, she's like, she's deliberately like doesn't care. Um, let me see if there's a, oh no. Um, okay, so um, let me go back to this, this uh, as you saw, as this short animation, the uh, anthropomorphized Aedes aegypti, the female and the male, um, this outfitted with tiny high heels, the female Aegypta is depicted as having an abrasive and unkind personality. Her recurrent laugh, like she's always like, ha, 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 sounding uh, particularly evil, right? Um, it's almost, for me, it reminds me of a witch. The, the nose, everything is it's to make her like more, more of a villain. Uh, when confronted about transmitted dengue, AED, Egypta disdainfully dismisses the whole thing as not being her problem, while also mocking the many failed attempts against uh, her, uh, attacks against her. She even scorns the male mosquito Hades for being a veggie, a vegetarian, and being at good nothing, uh, being good at nothing more than following her around. We didn't see that part, but Hades, on the other hand, is characterized as a much more sympathetic way. The male is soft-spoken and seemingly submissive until it's revealed at the very end that he's secretly deceiving the female. Hades is a transgenic mosquito. So in the case of... Oh, Dengue fever is... In the case of transgenic mosquito, Aedes aegypti, it seemed that to make sense of the remaking of human mosquito encounters into significantly new terms, Proponents of this technology had to hold on to more than human gender stereotypes of horny males and picky females, of heroic males and villainous females, and to frame the male transgenic mosquito as an ally, as a hero. Proponents of the strategy also had to foreground the act of biting and the biological need for blood, something only females seek, as a defining characteristic in the negative uh, human mosquito relationship. So I will, um, since I know we're very tight on time, um, I'll use this time just to mention uh, some of um, my current research. So um, transgenic mosquito is only one of the new forms of, of mosquito modification to use the mosquito itself to address uh, diseases, right? Uh, pathogenic viruses that cause diseases. Um, and I think the, to, to examine the development of novel mosquito technologies as an anthropologist and SDS scholar is crucial, especially if we consider uh, the relationship between climate change, emerging disease ecologies, and the politics of knowledge production. Um, so I give you like a very short trailer of my current research. Um, well, ex environmental discussions, both in the natural and the social science, have focused on the negative impact that climate change has on insects and other animals, which might even cause several species to go extinct. And of course, these are very crucial and pressing concerns. It is important to highlight that for the Aedes aegypti, global warming has been the boom. Projections show that with shorter and warmer winters, 
the Aedes aegypti will likely soon thrive in large parts of Europe and the United States, producing a new mosquito epoch that might reshape current epidemiological geographies. Right, and here the mosquito are coming for us, who are the, who's the us? Anthropologists, whenever there is a us, we're like, who, who is the us being imagined here? And here it's interesting to consider the place of Brazilian mosquito ecologies within what I call the reinvention of mosquito science, right? These novel technologies being developed ever century of anti-mosquito campaigns that have produced only temporary results. As a prominent entomologist that I interview, Memory Lee told me that when, when it comes to mosquitoes, the world will become Brazil. In other words, due to the climate change driven global expansion of the Aedes aegypti, other places might soon endure the outbreaks currently besetting Brazil. So my current project called The World Will Become Brazil, um, Ecologies, Epidemics and the Reinvention of Mosquito Scientists focuses on the Aedes aegypti to examine how climate change is not only creating new epidemiological geographies, but also prompting epistemic shifts. Therefore, I examine how Brazilian researchers depicted mosquito ecologies as the locus point to produce a Brazilian science that would challenge the geopolitics of knowledge production, right, in the global north dominated science. Yet I also show how even as they question hierarchies within knowledge making, my interlocutors often reproduce long-standing racializing inequalities within Brazil. So for this new project, I conducted ethnographic uh, research in Rio de Janeiro with the group, uh, with a research group infecting Aedes aegypti with Wolbachia, a bacterium that inhibits viral transmission, in Recife with another group irradiating uh, male mosquitoes and releasing these sterile insects to mate with the wild ones and prevent future mosquito generations. And with the third group in Foz do Iguaçu, which used the mosquitoes need for human blood to entrap them, test them for DNA viruses, and transform them into sentinels, mapping this insect's presence, distribution, and status as a vector. And here, by using ethnographic and historical research methods, I argue that these projects can tell us something about the racialized geopolitics of science in the unequal world increasingly affected by human activity. So thank you very much. Luisa, while you were talking about all these kind of comments, you know, gender stuff like that, I was I was also thinking about how is the perception of the, the the people around us about science, no? Because as you comment, they were working in the factory, and maybe for us as a science, it will be happy to feed the mosquitoes, no? <laughs> but the local perception was really very different from our perception. So do you have some comments on that? That's a great point. And I think it's also like it becomes a kind of recurrent cycle, right? Um, like maybe the workers weren't unhappy just because they were feeding mosquitoes, which they um, see as like this unwanted uh, organism, but also because they saw that their labor was not, they were not very well paid and like their labor wasn't valued and that kind of the, their negative, never negative um, view of feeding mosquitoes and caring for mosquitoes was also shaped by the structure inequalities within the project, right? So it's these things kind of like uh, the perception of scientists is shaped by multiple things. Um, and I think, I think that sometimes when we think about science, um, promoting like scientific knowledge to other like beyond scientists, the context in which this knowledge is acquired matters in a way that is not always taken into account of this. And that's what anthropologists try to do, right? It matters what context people get this, this information or how they find out about these things. But that's a great question. Because the scientists themselves were, I mean, they weren't the ones feeding the mosquitoes. They weren't doing the heavy labor, but they, they were, they thought the mosquitoes were very exciting and interesting. And, um, but again, they were better paid than the technicians. Um, hi, Louisa. Uh, I 
I want to know if you find, or the other scientists or anthropologists, find the same characteristics of the labors from the factories on the other sites in Brazil. And they oh, apply the oh, same sorry. business model, uh, the same business model that you present to us. Or there was different characteristics uh, from the culture on, and how you, uh, the, the firm uh, that was uh, the sponsor for, for this uh, research, uh, uh, build the campaign or how, how they different, uh, perform the, the campaign differently. A great, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so the other projects, it's, it, there's also a 10 year difference. So this project I did in, in 2013, and then not 10, but like five, six years difference. The other, the, this more current project I did in 2020, 2021. And I did not see the same gendered language. Um, I think kind of um, there's a broader cultural shift in how like awareness of of perhaps gender language, at least in work environment that I didn't I didn't hear the same the same jokes about uh, horny males, uh, even though, for example, in the irradiated mosquitoes, it's more or less the same logic, right? They're also only releasing males and not females. Um, and I think in all in all the three projects that I saw, so I'm the one who's doing ethnographic research in the other projects, right? In Rio, Isifi, and, and Foz do Iguaçu. And in all the different projects, um, there was inequality within the project. That's, that's one of my main arguments, right? The, these scientists were all trying to question a global North dominated science in which Brazil as other global South countries is seen as only a place for uh, data collection. And Brazilian scientists are often not seen as scholars, just like collecting, co like are used just to collect data, right? These, all these scientists were questioning this long established inequality of like global North as thinkers and global South as just like doing the field work or doing the, the research in the field. Um, they were doing that, but in all the three projects, the scientists were all white, all white Brazilians, and the technicians were a much more diverse uh, group of people that truly express Brazil as, as a diverse country, right? Um, and there were, for example, uh, in one of the projects in Rio, um, you they had to release the mosquito across the entire city, and Rio has some neighborhoods uh, where access is very difficult because of um, local violence. And then it was the technicians, most of them black, who are already from these communities, who were the ones who ended up being sent to these neighborhoods that are already that with an in increase um, chance of violence to happen, right? So the Brazil's racial inequalities or Rio's racial inequalities was then, again, I'm not saying the scientists were like, the, like uh, aware that they were reproducing race inequalities, but that's what happened, right? Um, so the, sorry, I have a chat here. Um, so that's kind of the difference in which how inequality, like scientific projects can reproduce inequalities within society, even if the scientists are not aware of, of that. Can I have a, can I make another question? Okay. Um, and you say that you keep diaries from your field experience. Ex experience. And mm -hmm. I, I want to know how this build your uh, experience as an anthropologist, because you are in, in this method, there is mm -hmm. a, a brick for the anthropologists to build something in their no, uh, personal knowledge or something like that. And you describe most of the results from the, the, your research, but your main experience as an anthropologist, what the, the contribution that you said that this research built to yourself. 
to myself? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. So yeah, so anthropologists, as we're in the field, we like make some short notes so we can remember, right? Um, or when someone says very, something very important. Um, and I like write down the notes. Uh, and this wasn't my concern when I um, went to do field work with transgenic mosquitoes. Um, but I became more and more interested in thinking about Brazilian science and like who gets to define Brazilian science, uh, how funding matters for who gets to define Brazilian science. So um, my interlocutors who spoke better English often because they came from wealthier neighborhoods, uh, from wealthier families could access money much more easily so they could do their research because they had they did their grad studies uh, at, at the US. So they had friends who were like, oh, there's this grant, so you should apply, let's collaborate. Um, so like socioeconomic uh, mattered for scientists once even once they had these positions. So I started anthropologists think a lot about their own positionality, right? Like how who you are in the field ends up shaping what kind of knowledge you get together or not. Um, so I reflect on, my, on this, it's currently like a, a book manuscript. I reflect a lot about um, first how the fact that I was in Brazil as a Brazilian um, during a moment where there's a lot of budget cuts, right? Um, this was Temer and Bolsonaro's government when I was in Brazil. So there was a lot of uncertainty with my, my colleagues, right? These, my interlocutors, the scientists, the students, the technicians, were constantly uh, concerned if they were gonna get their salaries, their fellowships or not. Um, because I had dollars, um, I had grants paid in dollars, which actually during my stay in Brazil, the dollar was valued more, more like was increasingly more valuable in, in than the real. Um, I could, I, I didn't have that concern, right? Like I was still a student, but a student that knew that my my fellowship in dollars was going to get paid by the end of the month um, in the way that my my friends my intellectuals did not. So I, I think a lot about that. Uh, what it means that I'm talking about Brazilian science to a mostly because I write mostly English to a mostly Anglophone audience. Um, how it I, I end up representing Brazilian science. I also started thinking a lot about whiteness, uh, branquitude in Brazilian science because I. I was never questioned that if I was a scientist or not, like I was often seen as kind of belonging. Um, and there's a lot of black anthropologists who are studying science that have um, discussed how their presence in these spaces, these scientific spaces was often questioned and being like, uh, but you're a scientist, what? No, you're, you're a technician, right? You're, I have the, the anthropologist I mentioned, Rosana Castro, has a very interesting article about that. <laughs> how she uh, she was doing research in like a medical uh, environment and she was often seen as a nurse and not as a researcher. Uh, so how like your own racial identity kind of you're read as belonging to certain spaces and not others. So that's kind of that end up being part of my current research uh, in, in about Brazilian science. So thank you for the question. Thank you. Hello. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, uh, I really like the presentation, uh, first of all. So, uh, and I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, mm -hmm. well, uh, first, um, well, there was a talk about uh, we are like anthropomorph at making mosquitoes more human. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th that, that word is kind of hard. Um, mm -hmm. And well, how, how it, but I never, uh, cut, I, 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 when, well, how do we decide if it is worth to, well, for example, um, make transgenic mosquitoes? Uh, or, uh, as humans, how can we like decide that it is? Because we can, we we can get uh, make transgenic mosquitoes because we are doing it. But uh, <laughs> uh, why do we uh, have the idea that we we can do it? Like it, it is morally correct to do it because well, humans have over the, the history of the world, modified many, many species. Like, uh, for example, the, the, there is like one kind of dog that like 
does not have like a really good quality of life, it is like the pack, I think, the, the pack. So how can we justify um, morally the um, uh, alteration of, of a mosquito? Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, and as an anthropologist, I often, I'm not a philosopher, so I won't give you kind of like a definitive answer, uh, like should we, is it ethical or not to, to mo modify mosquitoes? Uh, as an anthropologist, what I'm interested in is like the specificity. So for me, it matters if we're modifying mosquitoes uh, to lock people into a business model in which they have to constantly be paying a company. Uh, that's very different than trying to do something that will be sustainable, right? Like the, the technical differences within modification matter, uh, in, in my opinion, for the ethics of these products or not. Um, so I think uh, how, how, like, I, I don't want to, I don't want to give like uh, answer that this is natural, this is unnatural because these these definitions are often arbitrary. Um, so I don't I don't I don't like going for ethics in that sense of like defining where exactly is the line of one one modification like genetically modification is unethical, but breeding uh, naturally is ethical, right? Because then what what become like where you divide where you put the line is often arbitrary. I think it's much better to think about the practices and the specificities of one case. So um, I think there's a big difference, for example, if we think about transgenic organisms, if you think about Monsanto logics of, <laughs> of how to make tr transgenic organisms exist in the world, than if you have other logics behind, right? And I think that's important. Um, humans have tried to eradicate mosquitoes for a long time. Um, and I think it's not about if or not we use transgenic mosquitoes and other modify, uh, other transgenic technologies is much more how we use it, who is using, by whom, to whom, right? Like what are the structures in place that allow or not these technologies to be in place? I think that to think about, it's a lot harder, I think, uh, but I think that much more productive to think about the specificities and how that ends up mattering um, for, I know one of the themes of the school is governance. So governance, a governance that allows, takes into account the specificity of each case, uh, who is benefiting, who is not, right? Like you had this technology that was experimented in a place and now the people who were experimented on had no uh, lasting benefit. They were just experimented on for data. Um, I don't think that's ethical. Um, but it's not that I'm against transgenic mosquitoes in general. I just think the way we implement those things matter. OK, thank you. And uh, I have another question. Um, mm -hmm. Well, at the, I don't know if it was the beginning or in the middle of the presentation, you said about uh, transforming uh, the mosquitoes from an enemy for, to an ally. Yeah, and there is uh, there was this picture where uh, a picture or video where uh, you uh, there were a, there was a box of male mo uh, transgenic mosquitoes and people could uh, put their hand inside the, the box and mosquitoes uh, mm -hmm. didn't um, bite them bite they mm -hmm. bite, yeah um, well my, my my problem with it is that um, you, you, uh, one uh, when when one does that. You are kind of, uh, I don't know if, if this is the word, but de-dangerizing de the mosquito? Because, um, well, it, the, the, I remember in my school, um, there was a, a kid who, who found a spider. He tried to grab it to take it outside, and the spider beat him. And he said, no, but uh, one has to protect the spiders. And, and the professor said, no, I mean, we have to protect the spiders, but they still pose a great threat to us. And, well, my point is, uh, uh, well, w what are the dangers of, 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 of this kind of de-dangerizing uh, de the mosquitoes? Like, w w what do you think about it? It's a great question. Thank you. Um, yes, especially if they, I, I agree with you. Um, and I think 
because they were trying, what, what was, as an anthropologist, what was interesting for me, because that they had to do both, right? They had to say mosquitoes are a threat, but mosquitoes are also an ally, right? They had to constantly do both things. Um, but I think just to go back to the other answer is, it is particularly dangerous to danger, well, I like the word you use, like danger, make it less dangerous, uh, undangerized or something you said, uh, to make mosquitoes less dangerous, especially if the technology, if you stop using the technology, right? Uh, and that was one of the critiques um, and the kind of the risk that the population, once stop, releases stop, it's not that just that the population goes back to so-called original numbers, but that it could increase because people got used to not having the mosquito as an enemy. They got used to not clearing their uh, pot, like their plant, the, the plant uh, play thing, uh, right? They, they got used to not doing all these um, strategies, which although we know have limited like success, they have some success. Uh, and so there's a risk in um, doing, in presenting the mosquito as just an ally and that the mosquito as a threat stays there and, and becomes an even bigger threat. Uh, in the other projects I, I went to, they were more aware of um, telling people that, you know, you can't differentiate, for example, the Wolbachia group, like you can't differentiate a mosquito with a Wolbachia without a, or without Wolbachia. You can't differentiate a mosquito irradiated or not. So if you see a mosquito, you kill them. Um, and I, I think that was also a difference in, in how to relate to, to people. Like there is this one mosquito that's good, but the, we don't know how to, to differentiate. So keep treating mosquitoes as an enemy. Thanks. Thank you very much. Boa, Luisa, é, queria elogiar a sua apresentação aí. Parabéns, eu achei o máximo. Trouxe Obrigada. Um, uma perspectiva assim brilhante, cara. Parabéns. Obrigada. So you pretty much proved us that it's possible to see human traces in the mosquitoes. And uh, when we do this with the science, do also bring uh, social issues to the mosquitoes, which is the case of the gender question that you talk about. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what do you think is the impact in science when we do this? When we, the science, bring human issues, social issues, as the gender questions into science, how do you think that the, this does affect science? Uh, great question. Um, and I think there's no way not to bring uh, like social aspects into science. I think they're because scientists are humans, they will uh, in, in avert, like without noticing, they will bring the, the social issues. I think it's the importance is to be aware um, of, you know, it's it's the, the whole argument that it's natural, so it's naturally that males want females. Um, but the way we speak about this nature matters, right? That's that's what the anthropologist argument. Like, we're not saying that there isn't a reality there where male mosquitoes are uh, searching for female mosquitoes. It's not that. But the way we talk about this nature uh, matters. So it was, just to give the example, when the scientists were making this joke, it was, it's, I, I was much younger than I am right now. Uh, I was just starting, I was still going to start my PhD. Um, it made me as a woman very uncomfortable. It made the women technicians very uncomfortable. It reinforced the space as a masculine space, right? So that matters, like who sees themselves as being part of, um, of doing science uh, when you're using certain language or not. So I think, the impact um, is was visibly there, and I think to be aware how certain as certain things that are seen as natural are also social. And not to say they're not natural, but they're also social, and the way we think about them, the way we talk about them, uh, are shaped by our values, our culture, our former experiences. Um, it's a, such an important aspect if we want to have a more um, equitable uh, and inclusive uh, science spaces. So thanks for the question.
Obrigado. Parabéns novamente. Obrigada. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask about the same thing because these ad campaigns, I don't know if they are made with these negative stereotypes because they are effective or if it is because they reflect the bias of the people who make them. So I wanted to ask if there has been a measure of how effective this is and how we could replace these negative ad campaigns with something that is maybe as effective, being at the same time less controversial and less harmful for society overall. And also if these ad campaigns have been implemented in places that are more and less socially delayed, let's say. Thanks. Um, it's interesting the question of effective, right? Because it's only effective because it's reproducing uh, sorry, stereotypes. Let me, oh. let me explain that. Oh. And of course. I'm not trying to say effective as in, let's say, it, if it improved public perception or not about the experiment that is being done. Or, yeah, no, I, I, I understood that you're not using effective in like, as a more like it's good or not. Um, but so I didn't do, I, I didn't do work for Oxitec. I didn't measure how effective uh, it was. But I think it's important that the ad campaigns and the, like, the jokes, um, they only make sense because these stereotypes are present in our society, right? Um, and then as, as you do these jokes and as you use these kind of ads, you're reinforcing the stereotype. So you're, it becomes a cycle. So they make more sense because it's right. Like they are, um, part of the culture. So how do you break that? How, uh, how I, I don't think there needs to, there is no culture out there separate that exists at a, as a pre, just like science is closely co-produced with society, right? Like society changes. And I think, um, thinking about how the jokes we make, the, the way we produce campaigns, ad campaigns, is also helping to reinforce certain gendered or other stereotypes is important, right? Um, so it's only effective in the sense that if you already have this stereotype in your, in your mind. Um, so I, I understand your question in the sense of like ad campaigns want to, to make something impactful and kind of wants to get the message across. And in a sense they do, right? You get the message the, the, of how the technology works, but what do you lose or how, how are you contributing to particular stereotypes as you're doing that as well? And I think as, as scientists, as, you know, as, um, people empowered in general, you have to be mindful of your impact to also contribute to public and cultural uh, perceptions. Um, and I also think uh, there are more creative <laughs> ways to express these, these very novel and in a ways, in, for me, I went because I'm very interested in the idea that mosquitoes could also be allies, right? For me, it's, it was, a, um, I was a kind of disappointed that they were like, it's, it's this huge different thing of how we think about mosquitoes. We've been, uh, we have this possibility to rethink what it means to live with mosquitoes, but then they were using super antiquated and uh, gender ideas of, of what it means to be a man, a male, a macho and a, and a female, a femia. So I think, I think that was, that was, that, that would be how I would answer this question. I don't know if it's exactly what you wanted, um, but yeah. Thank you very much. It's a good answer. Right. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, hi, Luisa. Um, I, have, uh, I have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. the, the first one is, what could be the potential risks to the environment, the release of these uh, modified mosquitoes? And the second one, uh, is there a possibility of or investigation research that uh, 
tried to avoid that the mosquito got infected with the virus uh, from, from the start. So maybe it's easier to avoid that, uh, that, that, the, that infection in the mosquito itself mm -hmm. than avoid that the female die after they bite or so whatever. Thank you. Um, so I can tell you a little bit what some entomologists say about the, the potential risks. Um, I'm not a bio biologist and I'm not an uh, ecologist. I saw that um, Larry Hoffman is joining you later, so I'm, I'm sure um, he will be able to tell you a little bit more about the potential risk. Um, so one that some entomologists told me as potentially the most uh, concerning one is that if you have a population of Aedes aegypti which is reduced very quickly and you create a certain uh, empty ecological niche, um, you can have, for example, Aedes albopictus enter and, and become like an urban mosquito. Um, and Aedes albopictus, as some of you might know, it bites humans, but it also bites other mammals. So the chances of a virus jumping from one species to the other could um, could would be increased. So that's one potential risk. Um, there were potential risks of of kind of uh, a certain concern that certain genetic material from the oxytec mosquito would enter like local mosquito populations, which in fact did happen. Um, the kind of environmental or ecological impacts of that uh, of that particular non-local genetic material um, were not well, it's not clear yet so it's again there's also potential risks that we don't don't know about it right um, so it's not just I'm not saying that there are no no potential risks um, but uh, the, the, your second question, or how to avoid mosquitoes to get infected with the virus, so that's what um, the Volbachia group is trying to do, uh, and they have been expanding uh, across Brazil, and that's currently what um, the Ministry of Health has more officially uh, being supported. They, the, they're like an Australian group, but they're they were also being releases were being done in collaboration with Fiocruz. So the 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 big global brand is called um, World Mosquito Program, WMP. Maybe you heard of them. Um, and then in Brazil, there was um, a Fiocruz researcher who was taking the lead uh, in, in Brazilian uh, releases. And how it works, they infected this mosquito with a bacterium, uh, Volbachia, uh, which inhibits the viral replication inside the mosquito body. They don't really know how it does. So they have two hypotheses. One is that um, because the mosquito is infected with the um, the bacterium, there would be something called immune priming, right? So it's like it's as if the immune system of the mosquito would already be better prepared to deal with the virus the moment it got the virus. So it would the virus wouldn't reproduce as much inside the mosquito body as in other cases. Uh, in the cases where without the the the, the microbe, um, as if we if we remember, mosquitoes are also sick with the virus. That's why they infect us. They they are also infected. Infected. The second hypothesis is just that Volbachia competes for resources inside the mosquito body, which doesn't allow the virus dengue, Zika, or Chikungunya to to reproduce inside the mosquito body. Um, so in both cases, in both hypotheses. The, the end result is the virus doesn't replicate as much inside the mosquito body. The mosquito body, the mosquito never becomes infected to a point that is infectious. Uh, so it bites us uh, and it doesn't transmit pathogens. So um, the idea here is no longer to suppress a population, but to transform a population from vector into to non-vector, right? Uh, which is kind of what you you were pr proposing or asking about it. Thank, thank you very much. Right. Might have to leave in a little bit, so maybe if there are more questions, we can collect them. Uh, and I think I think we have finished with the question. So we thank Perfect. you very much for this very nice talk. Um, 
Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I can't see you, which is kind of strange, but thank you very much for... Um, we can go over the front and say goodbye. Yeah. Uh, we have this. Hey. <laughs>